And we're live. So welcome back to another Tavern Talks with myself, of course, the Grumpy DM, Corey from Chrysalis Endeavors, and our new guest, Chris, who is one of our newest, uh, a guy from our newest sponsor and partner that we're working with, Dungeon Studios. So please introduce yourself, Chris. Hi, my name's Chris Bazenye, and I'm one of the creative directors for Dungeon Stream Studios. I'm essentially the guy who's writing all the lore and helping get everybody's ideas all put together and connecting all the little dots to make sure the world meshes and is a nice, coherent story. Awesome. So yeah, Chris is going to probably join us multiple times in the next couple weeks as we dive through the Dungeon Master's Guide which everybody says that they never read, which I'm going to be honest, I, there's been moments where I haven't read it myself, especially 5th edition. If you've read 3rd edition and 3.5 and uh, the rest of them, the you book. just kind of get more. But thank you for the bits. Um, Dungeon Studios, we are excited to have them on board. So, And there's not just Chris, there's a slew of artists, musicians, storytellers, lore writers and all sorts of fun things and we are just excited to have them on board so before we do anything please chris give me your background as a player of D. &D. well my journey in the world of dungeons and dragons began with a little virus known as covid19 um so I actually avoided D&D &D for a very long time in my life. I had a experience with a very strict dungeon master in um, high school. I, I really just wanted to tell jokes, and Buddy wasn't having it. He stormed out of my basement, left me and my buddy sitting there like, I don't know, man. I thought it was funny. <laughs> um, so that was just kind of like, that was it for me, man. I was, I was done. I was scared right off of it. I went years and years, never going back to it. I, I did Magic the Gathering. I did lots of other stuff. And then it, once this, this pandemic hit us, I, I'm just left at home like, oh, man, what, what do I do? What can I do that's fun? So I, I had a friend who was just always pestering me. Chris, let's play some D&D. &D. Chris, I'll write your character sheet for you. Chris, <laughs> let's do this. So I broke down COVID. Fine. Let's do this. I had so much fun. Uh, I even remember my wife walking in one day as my character, um, Kilgore Scampers the Sodomizer, was doing his stuff. And she's just laughing her ass off, just off to the side. And she, as soon as I was done, she looked at me, how do I get involved? And I'm like, I'll write you a sheet. We'll do this. Uh, so I did that for a little while, just for a couple of months. And it got to be Halloween. And my one friend, the, our DM, he looked at me and he's just like, Chris, how would you like to do like a little a little short um something that's very halloween themed halloween being my my main my main bag i i agreed um so we started that that little campaign um by the way the title of said campaign is dungeons and dragons versus the evil dead um so we started that um and after a couple of sessions of that it's like hey you've been writing a lot of notes huh? yeah yeah you want to take over? I was like, sure. Why not, man? Go for it. Um, and I've been DMing ever since. I've been on Start Playing Games. Uh, I've posted. I had a group that also was able to run through the Evil Dead campaign. Uh, I just finished with them last week, actually. So really excited about that. That's basically it, man. That's how I got started. Awesome. Yeah, it definitely sounds like... A some of us uh i got lucky like i've said before uh, i got lucky had a great game master um back when third edition was the newest edition and uh i was in high school Corey, uh what was, what's your story i don't think we had a chance to get your story yeah again yeah i i was uh in high school just like just like you you know I, all of my friends were a lot older than than me uh grew up in a military town and uh, went to the local game store and most of my friends were active duty and doing um, you know at running games at the game store and uh, we even had uh, a, a playtest group that would playtest new stuff um, 
they tested some Steve Jackson games. Uh, GURPS Horror Ooh. was the was the second edition. GURPS Horror was the first time I got my name in a book, and I was like seventeen, and I was just <laughs> just so excited, right? Um, and then been uh, game mastering different games and uh, creating games ever since. So yeah, I, and and I would say that uh, even before I learned D and D, when I was like playing with GI Joes and Legos, I'd make stats for them and, and make actually rule sets and stuff. So, so yeah, I've been doing this since uh, probably since inception. I don't know. <laughs> no, I feel you there. I mean, like I said, I've told people before, is mine wasn't even in D and D at first. I started when I was about seven or eight years old on an art online role play. it was an online game it was just uh, a website that you go play these little stupid games but at the same time there were these small um groups you could become or gather with and then it just became a collaborative story and then once i found out that there was an actual name for it with dungeons and dragons i was like oh i found my home so uh yeah but what we're going to go over today is is what a lot of people, at least I know I have at first at times had troubles with it. I'm sure the rest of you have at least had some sort of difficulty with it. World building at the beginning. Not when you've got something, not when you have, you're pulling from modules. We're talking from a blank piece of paper. Where do you start? The big picture information that you need. So I know from the book that it states that you kind of go with what is known what are the core elements of your world or your your uh narrative um is it going to be a high magic is it going to be gritty and barely any magic and magic is evil is it going to be one god two gods millions of gods is it going to be shifting between planes on a constant basis is it a ripple between the different planes these are all questions that have to be answered when you start building these large pictures this is though i will admit before we go any farther than this there are two ways that most people build games either inward out or outward in right now we are going to talk about an outward in concept so before anybody starts like stabbing me from the internet that's that's the direction we're going with this so um what's your guys's opinion on the outward in concept and what would you say would be your top things you would have to know in order to start your world building? I think you named some of them uh, and, and I'll toss it over to Chris. The, the things, um, who are the gods and what do they have control over and how active are they? Right. Cause there can be a lot of gods, um, you know, that, but they're not really active in the, the things of the world. Or there could be a lot of gods that are very active and you get these like messages from them to do certain things, right? Um, and I think you have to know that, that frame before you can start, you know, telling, because I, I think about the, the, um, the Vikings TV show. Mm -hmm. Lots of gods, but they're not really active. You know what I mean? And, and But they're, they're core to the story of that Vikings TV show. Um, and I think that the other thing you mentioned about magic, where does it sit, right? And mm -hmm. everybody has to know where it is because you don't want uh, some players thinking it's high magic like Forgotten Realms and other players thinking it's like Conan, right? Mm -hmm. Where there's low, manage, low magic. So, um, yeah, I think that those those two big things is one place to start. Chris? Yeah. yeah, I would have to agree with you, absolutely. You need to know what makes your world tick. And by knowing... Who made the world is going to really be a big aid to that. Um, to not have that is it's very difficult. Um, so I, I myself, I usually like to start off with first of all, what do I, what kind of story I want to tell for my players, and then I go out from that and I go, okay, so how does this world come to be? What are the what are the rules of the world? Uh, what are the rules of the magic? Because like. Um, James said that this, you know, you could have a world where there is no magic. Uh, you can have a world where there's magic, but it's extremely rare, or it's just a part of regular day utility in life. Yeah, so, and you see this in modern cinema a lot. So, 
something gritty that doesn't have a ton of magic. Uh, the the ones I'm tr I'm trying to think of one specifically for that that culture. But as you start to get bigger and bigger in the magic aura, you go to stuff like Lord of the Rings, where magic's there and people can use it, but it's not the center point. And then you go to things like, and we're going to go very Miyazaki, like Howl's Moving Castle, where everything has a magical or connection to it, somehow, shape, or form. And knowing where you want to... What was that? The reference, by the way. Yeah. So one of the ways... And the other one I could think of that is a little different, I would say it's not magic, but it is. Think of How to Train Your Dragon. It's not magic. There's not really magic in the world. But you're running around with dragons, the most mythical creature anybody ever talks about. So these core pieces will definitely change the whole epic of the story. Now, the second thing is deity. What is your divine connection? Where do they how do how much do they develop? How much do they influence the world and how much do they influence the people directly? So as you said, Vikings, they were, they're very important. They're part of their culture. They have a connection, but if they're not just upfront and personal with them, where you go into, and I'm going to take another very huge direction difference is Disney's Hercules. They're all over the darn place and they interact all the time. So these two things can drastically change how your players will interact in the world and how the world is developed in first place. Now, one thing I like to do personally, and I'm sure we'll get your guys' opinions on this as well, is starting with that of, of a very high divine connection at the beginning because something had to build whatever you have. But then how did they lose it? What happened? What kind of catas catastrophe or disaster or war or whatever the conflict is has changed now the connection between the world and the divine or the diaphic, whichever way you want to pronounce it. But what do you guys think? Corey? That's been the, Oh yeah. Corey, oh, sorry. Was... Oh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, that was one of the really big things that we're currently working on right now with the dungeon stream studios is our cosmology and our pantheon and how it works and we're kind of going with like a trickle down effect where you have your your primary gods that created these these primordials and it kind of just trickled down from there until you get their finalized versions the the mortals the elves the tieflings uh, so we have them all matched up we're even uh, creating a chart we have one of our writers right now who's currently working on a chart that will actually allocate um, certain like cleric orders or paladin orders that you could take it. And we're making sure too that it's not like we're not railroading people like you have to take this guy. Uh, no, because realistically, um, two different gods from two different areas could say be a part of life. Mm -hmm. um, they are create they are creators, so their connection to life is is, is there. Uh, and so that's been a, a really big thing that we're working on is how we get from these this god that creates these other gods that goes and creates life um, basically through their uh, sibling bickery that this is all born from. Nice. I'm going to jump back to something Chris said earlier about trying to figure out how what the story that you want to tell and, and kind of what are those things that you want to do in your game? Um, and having those, the magic and the divine and all of those big kind of why pieces, right? Because you have to know why things happen the way they happen. Having all of those why pieces line up so that you can tell the story you want to tell. Um, and the players don't necessarily have to know all of this stuff. They don't have to read you know all of this lore they could be from a small town and they really only know a few of the agricultural gods because that's what's what's you know big in their town 
Um, but as long as you have, and I don't want to cross over into the second part from the inside out. I'm still sticking with the outside mm -hmm. in. Um, as long as you know all of the framework and where you want them to go and what you want them to learn about, it might even be really enjoyable for them to discover gods in the world that they knew nothing about and discover how other people live and, and, and worship and you know do their tithing or whatever it is. Um, I think that that would be uh, something, you know, everybody thinks that to... To enjoy it, you have to know all the pieces, and I, I disagree with that. I think you can enjoy a game a lot not knowing all the lore and learning the lore in the game. Yeah, actually, that is what we're trying to do with our Pantheon currently right now. Um, the ancients are unknown gods. Nobody knows about them, and we are hoping that over time, people will find out a little bit about that story. Um, but yeah, no, you definitely want... You don't want people to be railroad. You want people to have that opening to tell their story, right? Because a lot of it is telling your story of your players and just trying to make some connections to make the story a little bit more interesting so that they feel like they fit within the world. So taking their story and finding a way to make them a part of this world and give that feeling of connectedness. No, that's that's a great. You guys did great on both of those concepts. Go I'm for it. Throw a question your way, James. Sure. Uh, based on what Chris just said, um, how do you kind of partner the big world to the you know the character driven stories? Because that's something that, like you said, you read backstories before every session, mm -hmm. right? So what is what are some of the tool, tricks and tools that you do to allow that player agency? And if they come up with something that doesn't quite fit in the cosmology, um, doesn't quite fit in in all of those pieces, what do you do to try and give that player that present, like we were talking about a couple sessions ago? So yeah, so that's a great great question. And a lot of times, what I'll do is, and it'll be more sporadic than you'd expect, is I'll read through a backstory three or four times over. A month period right if i run a weekly game i'm running i'm writing the reading the backstory every week but if i'm playing in my world or if i'm playing in someone else's world or a module i'm also getting that update from whatever i'm reading in the in those stories or what i'm writing in general um, my first campaign that i had ever written by myself full homebrew no no anything um started out with just a basic pantheon and then that was all designed around the dragon. So two dragons, Bahamut and Tiamat had a war. The war created the world by just the calamity between the two. And then as Tiamat died, was torn to shreds pretty much. The chromatic, or the, uh, yeah, the chromatic dragons were released because all the heads were each color and they birthed their own form to themselves and it was known that there were only one dragon of every color in the world and then as a defense mechanism bahamut not tearing himself but magically separating himself into the metallic dragons was able to gain his order and right what they didn't know and they didn't find out until halfway through the session or halfway through the campaign which was like 50 or 60 episodes is that these were nothing more than pets to an elder god. And when they found that, I watched their minds just go and explode. It was great. Um, and they found out that dragons weren't anything special, but the fact that they took that time and energy and kept that secret, they made themselves the gods rather than what they were. Um, and it was a lot of fun. So yeah, I do, I do a lot of times read through things, and a lot of the stuff I give my players is sprinkled in very quickly, and it's it's simple stuff. Uh, a session I had just last night, uh, there was a group of uh, band, well, cultists, and a veteran was there, and one of the players had sprinkled in something stating that the person that 
wrecked their village wore black armor and it was easy to just be like okay not only there's multiple of these but it gave that thrill and that drive to kill this character this this enemy to almost the point where they were risking their livelihood and their their consciousness of just a reckless rage to go straight at the enemy no matter if there's six or seven around them they went after that character because it was in their backstory and when you see those types of presence as you said um, you see the connection that the players gain even if it's small lore or big lore it's still wrapping them into that episodic world and scenarios that you're giving their players which is the excitement that we get as game masters is to watch the players unravel and create and collaborate with us in the world that we've put countless hours sometimes into so i think leaving a lot of openings to when you're trying to create a world for that keeping things vague so in such a way that the players can really add to your world because I find a lot of the times when I do that I get players that come up and they introduce new ideas in the world and I'm just like I'm my, my mind's blown and I'm like that's canon man like yeah check work you're good yep that's stuff right that's stuff um, which is really great and uh, you were talking about um, subtleties too I actually have a, another campaign with my R I uh, in real life players I'm not going to do the acting. Um, that uh, they don't know what's going on in the world yet, and I've been sprinkling it with certain events that are going on. I have one player who's a little wishy-washy on scheduling. I'm sure you guys know what that's like. Um, so one of the main things in this campaign, the name of the campaign is Nexus Tower, is that the worlds, the planets, and all the realms are coming to alignment. So basically my inspiration from this is while going through the monster manual and looking up the monodromes. Mm. And the fact that they have that march every, what, 285 years. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that was what kind of gave me the inspiration to create my world. And the whole purpose of my world was why do they march every 285, world, uh, 285 years? So that's what I've been working. And I'm giving them little little subtle hints here and there so the player who can't make it very often hey every now and then he plane shifts nobody knows why but he does yeah uh i had another player who joined in did the same thing uh he hasn't been back in months so his character is still technically in the elemental plane of air and he's just falling he's been there for months <laughs> but, you know that's it you know he's that's just, gonna be an so interesting happy. concept when he comes back he's like oh yes yes he's a very interesting homebrewed uh creature he is a lost soul oh nice so he walked in possessed somebody gave my other pcs the deed to a port um so i got two and two pcs who now own purveyor's port there you go um, <laughs> and then he just checked out <laughs> um Ooh, like uh, other things we're doing like in for the dungeon stream for instance we have a monster who's a byproduct of a large event known as the shattering and the shattering is this this cataclysm that shook the world to its very core to the point that it's 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 cracked all the way around um, spider webbing out from the center point uh, this effect caused a eruption of kinetic energy that reverberated throughout all the realms, breaking down the barriers between the realms and the very, the very things that were keeping them static, keeping them where they were. So now the, the realms are, are spinning within their cosmology. Every now and then they collide with one of each other, um, creating um, nexus points. Um, another thing that happened from this is we have a special creature that's Eneron Online exclusive is the Mass Trope. Um, so <clears throat> first to explain a little bit, uh, a trope is uh, it's 
it's a Greek word, and it's used to to find um, a organism's means of eating. Um, so this is a mass trope. So there's uh, different versions. If you look it up, I I, I can't really name any of them right oh, now. But the basic idea is when these realms. So you have all these realms, and they're layered. And then the shattering happens, and they collapse in on each other. So you have person in dimension A in one spot and then somebody in the parallel world to that dimension b in the identical spot and so on and so forth so when the shattering happened and these worlds collided in on each other these poor souls were fused together as a large mass of uh flesh and bone it is called the mastroph it's actually one of our very first creatures that we created for our world. Very cool. Um, my, my personal brain baby. Um, so the stats for him are absolutely insane. He has certain abilities that are pretty crazy. So he has I could just bring him up for myself right here so I can see it. Uh, so one of the abilities for the Mass Troph is Mass Bond. The Mass Troph chooses the living human... Uh, sorry... A living humanoid with zero hit points within 20 feet, extending an appendage, it makes contact and begins to bond with the creature on a molecular level. The creature is restrained and has disadvantage on death saving throws. If the creature dies while restrained this way, Mass Troph regains 25 hit points and can choose to Mass Fuse. And then to Mass Fuse, the Mass Troph can choose one feature from a single creature to fuse into its own feature list. You can have up to three fused features. If you attempt to fuse with a fourth feature, the, you must defuse with one of the other three, and the fused features last for one week. So the idea of this, this creature is essentially it is constantly building its mass. It starts off large. Once it reaches huge and unmanageable um, size, it actually splits off and creates another mass trope. Um, so that was one of the big big things we were we were working on that's kind of like to show hey this is what's going on in the world this is this is a byproduct and interesting can come very cool Corey, so, something you said real early on and and chris kind of alluded to it in their world's background we've talked a little bit about deities we've talked about magic but there's also there also needs to be some some dust on the world people have lived here before this is an old world lots of things have happened and i think that trying to figure out what those things are at at least in a regional level so that your players can come into this world in that first session or even session zero and and learn something about their history and tie some of their stuff even if it's something as uh as small as your village was raided by bandits two weeks ago, right? There's some event that they can tag to. Uh, and the more of those kind of historical events and the more uh, effort you put into um, having a background in your world and in, in your world building um, and, and sharing that with your players so that they can kind of think about, oh yeah, well, there was a war uh, I was just a young boy. My father fought in that war, and and before you know it, they've got this whole, you know, cool backstory that they can tie to, and then, and then you can read it every week and, and add things into it. <laughs> so. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, there's a couple other points that I was going to go over after we had gotten through the magic and divine, and those big ones are culture, history, and just land development. So you've got, you've got why is why is this mountain here or you know why does this mountain upside down rather you've got questions like these you have to answer or why does this only this specific flower only grow in this area what are these things that you've put into your world that are so fantastic that what is the reasoning that they're there and why is monster why are monsters here like what is the point of this these types of questions i think have to be answered early on in the game as well because otherwise what would it be that. that i love that you said that too we actually just had a creative writers meeting today for dungeon stream studios and that was exactly one of the topics we were talking about working on while working on our cosmology 
certain events. So we actually have writers that are set exclusively right now. Uh, one of them is writing fairy tales, grim style fairy tales um, for the world. Uh, these things could be real. They may not be real. Um, as well as we have another person that we want who is going to be... Because we have such a large event in this world. The Shattering is a, is a huge, huge event. It changes the very face of the the planet uh, that it, it, it's going to affect like our, our dwarves. Like, we're talking about an event that, that cracked the world practically in half. So we have to figure, you know, what happened to the dwarves that were underground when the shattering occurred? Mm -hmm. What happened to the, the, the drow in the Underdark yeah. when the, this all this earth just opens up? And that's that's been a big thing. So we even have one of our writers right now who's been tasked to be like, give us some war heroes. Give us some some lore that's all byproduct. So uh, uh, Josh, our, our main guy uh, for Dungeon Studios, he has taken the majority of the base races and have taken their write-ups and added how they have been changed mm -hmm. from this event. Uh, and I just tasked somebody else today with uh, taking the races that we haven't written up yet and finishing that off as well so that we have this this coherent world that everybody can get the understanding and realize how when writing their background stories how they want to fit their characters in because we talked about a little bit of having that that leeway for players to add their completely new ideas in the world and that's some players but other players are like well what do you got what, what are your gods because i like some of our players already i said hey write a background they're like cool God, I got it. Good. Done. Um, other guys are like, who are the gods? Who are the pantheons? Some people really, really want to know this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I also think that's why when world building, sometimes you might want to even consider who are your players before you even start your world build. Um, another thing, like with uh, with Tasha's, they added the, the lineage uh, and the way that you can kind of change that. So you can really flip the script on a lot of stuff that were put in there that's just kind of yeah, I get it for the time when you guys wrote that but right now this is a different time and things are much more mm -hmm. inclusive and we're, you want to get that so it's like you know do you want inherent racism in in this world like I would ask my players do you, do you want the world to have these dwarfs that are just they suck man <laughs> It's just it's the way they're written. It's just like, oh, that's, uh, you know, the people, you want to know what your players want. Yeah. You want to know what your players um, are comfortable with. And that's going to be a really, really big topic. And I think that's something you got to consider. So um, try to find your players first if you can. I mean, for myself, I haven't always been so lucky. Um, I have had to just write a idea and just throw it out there and hope that everybody liked it um by always making sure that even that there's a little leeway, leeway for rewriting is also a really good thing as well especially if you didn't find your players before creating your world make sure you have that little leeway so that when you find your players you can you make them feel like this is a game that they want to play yeah th i think that that's a a good good time to switch right from that That's outward right. in to the inward out um because i think you brought up a great point like if you have a group of players now it's one thing to build a world to do some world building that you want to run with a bunch of different people like you know with your with your stream you don't know who's going to come in right you're trying to build this big uh it, group of people to play in the same world it's you're we're trying to develop it so that's very much the outward coming in. But if, if you're picking up the DMG for the first time and you've got five friends that you want to run the game for, it's a good time to think about that from start from your players and work out. Work out from, like you were saying, you know, uh, about inherent racism or any other type of thing, right? You're sitting there with five of your good friends. You're going to run this game. It's a good time to have a conversation about what is the fantasy world that you want to play? What What is that fantasy world? Does that fantasy world include a lot of strife? Does it include high magic? Does it include 
uh, racism? Is there, do you want to challenge that, you know, through what we do and just have that kind of like session negative one, right? Not even a session zero. You're just talking about the type of world that you want to play in um, and, and get your characters feedback and then start building it out, start building out from the characters they create. If somebody wants to be a cleric, okay, well, let's talk about your gods and, 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 and does they, does that cleric worship one God or does that cleric worship like three or four gods? So, and yeah, so I'll just turn it back over to you, James, about going from the inside out from world building. Yeah. So the, um, Oh, do you I want was to go just for going something? to say, I, I was just going to say the session negative one. I noted that I'm going to use that. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, we're we're going to create a, a, another session. So you've got session zero where you're helping, but it's interesting, and you, you better bring up some really good points on this. Is that if they're friends or if it's new people that you've never played with, either way, if you're playing as a game master and you want to bring a story that's exciting to your players, find out what's exciting to your players. So that's. It's definitely a huge point that has to be looked at. Uh, one thing with that, though, is, like you said, let your players give something. If you haven't put, which we all know that this is not possible, to put 100% of a game world together and have it actually work properly. We have players who do things that will never work. But that's the fun of it. That's the fun. It's the, it's the chaos behind the storytelling. It is, but if what you can do is you can give yourself a small guidelines, a, an outline that gives the big picture. You don't have to fill anything in the big picture yet. You can just go big picture and then go right there. This is where we're starting. Let your players do everything else. Give them the opportunity to, what's your class? What's your race? What's your background? Okay, why? We have, I know Corey's got a mentor, and it's the same mentor that I have, which is Alphineas Goo from Gooey Cube. And the main thing he looks at everybody when he asks anything is why. If you can answer the why, then the whole story starts to grow faster. Why are there elves? Why are there dwarves? Why do they hate each other every time? Like, why is it that we always take the Lord of the Rings trope where elves and dwarves hate each other? Even though we don't make the sense of it and say, oh, they were in a war a long, long time ago. No, it's just they hate each other. There's nothing about it. There's no, there's no logic behind it. They hate each other. No. Yeah, no Con if, you're gonna, if elves and dwarves are going to hate each other, why? If you can't answer that question, they don't hate each other. It makes no sense. Um, you can tell me this is where I get excited because this is the stuff that I have to deal with all the time. <laughs> but these things can go all the way down to... Why is there a god of death? Why is there a god of life? Why do we have a god of metal? Like, what is the point of these things? If you don't have that understanding and your players don't have that understanding, sometimes it's very difficult to bring a player to something that they can't see, taste, or feel in themselves. So, I think for writing, yeah. that's extremely important. This, this, if you can add as much sensory effect to it, that's that's important it's, it's it's an immersive game it's role play right yeah no i agree and that's a big thing that we we have to ask these questions is like okay so if we started a character right now and i wanted to play an elven ranger let's say gloom stalker so we're going super dark he only likes to he likes to kill the undead and the un the 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 lost pretty much the ones that have gotten away of from normality. He's he's going after monstrosities, aberrations, those types of things. Thank you very much um, for the shamrock. The now you have to go back and you have to say okay, so as a game master, you're asking all these why questions now. Okay, why is an elf? Eh, you don't really have to know that he's an elf because he was born an elf. That makes sense. But why did you pick? Why'd you pick Ranger? What in your your history or what in what did you read? What did you grow up doing? What is this that brought you to being a Ranger? And then more so, why the heck are you going after the disgusting things in the bottom of the the well that nobody else is going to go after? What's the point of it? These questions when asked and you start watching people write these down or start to create them in their minds, the story is built for you. 
as a game master if you just let them tell it there's a lot of times in both my um because i do do paid gaming for for teams i also run the stream on sundays there's a lot of times this is exactly what i do i just sit and listen and you'd be shocked when they finally realize that all you've done for the last 20 minutes is sit there and they're like what happened i was like you guys were role playing you guys were talking to each other you guys were telling your backstories you guys were filling yourselves in i didn't have to do anything I, I i set the i set you in motion and you took off and i think those as a game master at least for me personally those are the moments that i get excited about because i'm like oh i don't have to tell the story you're telling my story as well as your own and that's where the collaborative game the collaborative storytelling i believe is really the best part of tabletop role -play. I was fortunate enough, actually, my last uh, session with my real life players, I had my first session that was 100% role play. Not a single die was rolled for combat, maybe some perception checks, uh, persuasion, deception, whatever. But other than that, and I loved it. Yeah. It was my favorite, favorite session that I've ever had. Uh, yeah, no, I agree, absolutely. What about you, Corey? Yeah, I think if you're uh, if you can get a whole session that's nothing but role play, and and it's nothing and you're not running fifteen NPCs to keep the role play going, right? You you have like two or three that kind of pitch in here and there to guide the story a little bit. I mean that's that's awesome. And there's I mean D and D itself isn't really made for that. I mean that's mm -hmm. we have to as a game master. Uh, allow for it whereas some other games are sort of made for the role play and the collaborative storytelling um and and some people call those like rules light games mm -hmm. whereas i see it as no if the rules are just to facilitate role play they're not right. it, it, it's not about it's not all about combat and and character progression and all of those things um blades in the dark for example is a good like people call it a role or a rules mm -hmm. light but i think I burning the burning is. wheel is another one that's really good for that yeah. as well uh, our, actually, one of our friends yeah. alex is a big fan of that one i actually but, had uh, one of my other players send me um, i don't know if you guys ever heard of tenra mm -mm. that's one from uh it's a japanese tabletop game okay. uh, uh send me uh you guys email later i'll send you a pdf yeah uh, it, it's heavy heavy on the role play yeah. aspect big time so back to the uh world building from the character perspective mm -hmm. and uh tossing it back to that you know the why and in that session zero when everybody's making their characters and you're asking okay why why a ranger mm -hmm. and somebody else is making a uh a sorcerer okay well why are you a sorcerer what what, what in your background and you start to see those blend together and the party start to kind of build on each other's background um and sometimes you have you'll have to ask what why are you guys together why do, why what brought you together um if you don't kind of mandate why they're together sometimes it's best if you yeah. just say yeah you're you're all you're all part of this thing and that's why you're together but uh it, having it come together on its own is is great especially yeah. if you're kind of pushing that why and and uh, allowing them to world build with you as they create their own characters. Um, because you may not have had that piece of history that uh, the two kingdoms were at war when they were young, right? That came from a character mm -hmm. saying, oh, well, the reason I became a fighter is because I, my dad, I lost my dad in this war with a neighboring kingdom and I've right. uh, always looked up to this person that I never did knew, right? Um, and that, that becomes canon. Yeah, and then you got a so then you got a cleric on the other end who's like I was in a war at a diff but he doesn't give enough information so you can put the those were the combating teams and stuff like that. Yeah, it's uh it's definitely fun to watch characters either knowingly or unknowingly blending their characters together. It's it's super um, fun to watch that. Yeah, absolutely. Corey, as you were talking about the um because you said sometimes it happens where you know you feel it's just going to be easier you guys are a part of a game or whatever and that's where you can still do a lot of 
building off of what the other players do with a session zero. Uh, one thing I've done before for my um, D&D versus the Evil Dead campaign. The, the campaign starts with them getting a letter from an old friend that they adventured with that invites them to Morristown, where the adventure will take place. So in my session zero for those players, I went, okay, so you guys were adventurers with Kilgore. Here is who Kilgore is. This is how he is. This is how he behaves. These are his characteristics. Okay, go. How did you guys meet him? How did you guys... How was your interactions with him? What is... So I like uh, I made sure that I gave that NPC certain certain little quirks. Um, always, you know, rejected by his tribe. Always trying to go out and create his own new diverse tribe, right? So I, I tell them, you know, this guy is going to treat you guys all like kinsmen, but he's going to be acting like he's the chief. Uh, so little things like that, and then all the players just started going, oh, uh, my guy would have done this with Kilgore, and my guy would be like this with Kilgore. So we did that in our session zero, and then it was amazing. When we got to session one, seeing them all, like, right off the bat, they are like, oh, Kilgore, old salty dog. Hey, yo, you remember back in whenever when we got that lynch? Yeah, buddy. Uh, it was great. Uh, it really helped, and it just added so much more depth to the story that that's so i have a question interesting about kilgore. for sure did kilgore survive a couple of sessions at least or did you eliminate kilgore early in the campaign i i he survives to the end but not before getting possessed by a kandarian spirit he was like, no, I love this character, but I'm going to make this character be killed by you. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I wanted to make sure that these players had a really good reason. So basically what happens in this story is there's a carnival. Um, somebody has a version of the Necronomicon in which that they summon the forest from the movies into the world of D&D. And this forest is growing and spreading. Mm. Um I actually use the Tesseract dungeon design for that dungeon. So the idea of the dungeon is if you were to take the, the paper and if you were to fold it up mm -hmm. and make a box with it, all those paths line up. Yeah. Right. Um, so I, I wanted to make sure, like, you know, they're going to want to go into this forest. Why? Because something came out of the forest, bit your buddy, and now your buddy's possessed and you've got this cleric that was just so happened to be in the tavern keeping him sedated. Very cool. All right. Well, we've got we've went over big world going inward. We've looked over inward going out. So any with all of our I know Chrysalis Endeavors is currently running stream. We're running stream over here in Tabletop Misfits. When this goes to video on demand on YouTube, please, if you have questions like these or these are questions you're having problems answering, place them in the chat rooms for us so that we can come back and answer these for you because this is what we've built this entire stream for. It is to make your lives as both game masters and players a little easier. Um, and if you guys want to ask me any questions, you can hit me up on the Dungeon Stream Discord. Correct. So, um, do you guys have anything else you guys want to discuss about the the prime requirements of starting to world build? I just want to leave it with uh, uh, one final kind of wrap it all together is make sure your players know those common things, you know before we start playing make sure they they have those a common understanding of the world um yes discovering some un, uh, unknown things is is good but uh having a common understanding of the world before you start playing so that um they don't get upset when when they try to do something that's way outside of the scope of the world like three of the players think this is a low magic world and then one of your players is their their only goal is to be this super powerful, you know, magical being, right? And you're like, 
okay, well, that's going to be hard to fit in here. So I think just to wrap it all up, make sure that your group of players has that core common understanding of what the world is. Agree, man. One half, hundred percent. Um, communication is key, especially when dealing with D and D. Communi talk to your players, see what they want, and try to accommodate that. Um, I say, yes, and right. That's that's a that's a big tool. Uh, another thing I always say is, uh, I tell my players is like, this isn't this isn't really my world. This is your world. I'm the vehicle for the story that you guys are going to drive. No, both of these are, are great points. And I'm not going to say much else other than D&D &D is built around collaborative storytelling and a mutual respect for both game master and player. So if you are a game master, please don't hold the reins too tightly. If you are a player, please help your game master. Don't fight him. And I swear you all will have a much better experience, have more fun at the table, and as I've said in multiple streams before this, you will talk about these stories as if they were real for years and years. And I think this is a wonderful place for us to take a sip and come back so we can talk more about our next adventure on Tavern Talks next week. Have a wonderful night. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.